Well, we are in the book of John. Uh, we've been going through the book of John for about 37 weeks, and we're going to keep cranking through the book of John uh, through Easter. And we're going to try and culminate John right at around Easter time just to be able to talk through the crucifixion and the resurrection uh, in April as, as Easter's taking shape. It's going to be a, it is a really challenging thing to read through. I don't know if you're reading ahead in John, but just every once in a while, I'll kind of, from wherever we're preaching, I'll just finish the book just to, to see the end of what we're going towards. And every time you read through the account of the crucifixion, there's just this, this deep uh, like ache to see uh, the, the crucifixion account, and then you read through the resurrection, and it's just this overwhelming joy. And I hope you take time at different points to read through those accounts. We will spend a good amount of time in that. I wanted to tell you, just to kind of catch you up a little bit on the book of John. Uh, this book of John has been amazing. And I, I think I've said this a few times, but I'll say it again. John's not a history book. It's not written to tell you what happened as like from a historical point of view. We've talked about how John is a totally biased author. Now that doesn't mean that he's inaccurate. Sometimes bias can sound like uh, inaccuracy. It's accurate because he was an eyewitness himself, but he's biased in the sense that he's writing with an agenda, a hardcore stated agenda. I write these things so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So when you read through the book of John, you're reading through words that are written so that they will draw you in. They're written to show you how critical it is to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Every word is given with that in mind. John curates the stories that he picks. He thinks about what words Jesus taught, and he's very open about the fact that if I put every word Jesus ever said, every story of what Jesus did, there wouldn't be enough pages to write on to fill volumes of the work that Jesus said and did. He chooses for your benefit specific stories and specific words. And we get into this uh, stretch that we're in now where Jesus is in the final day of his free life on earth, meaning he will be arrested in the coming hours on the narrative of what John is, is sharing. He's gone through this incredible stretch of time where he washed the disciples' feet before the Passover meal. He shares this final Passover meal with his disciples. He interrupts the Passover meal to introduce communion, this Lord's Supper idea where he takes the cup and the bread and he reallocates meaning. They already had meaning. The bread wasn't just random bread that Jesus was picking up and saying, hey, look, here's some bread. It was the bread of the Passover meal that was designed to be set aside, untouched, and he takes the bread. He says, this is my body given up for you, and he breaks it and shares it. He takes a cup it's supposed to be untouched throughout the course of the Passover meal. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. These are the things that Jesus did leading up to this moment. And then we have this stretch where Jesus, uh, a lot of people believe that he stands up and is walking with his disciples towards the Garden of Gethsemane from Jerusalem, the upper room, where he walks down through the Valley of Kidron and across to the Garden of Gethsemane, and that he may have even been walking through a vineyard when he said, I am the true vine and you are the branches. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener with this object lesson of being able to point to a vineyard to hold a branch in his hands and say, you were the branches. And now we get to this point where Jesus continues to teach. He's saying the last things that he's going to say before John 17, which is a prayer. He's going to pray for his disciples and then the, the crowd will show up to arrest him. Peter's going to chop off a guy's ear. It's pretty wild. <laughs> and so this is Jesus' final teaching with his disciples. And so that's the context of what we're getting into in John chapter 16. We're going to be in verses 16 through 33. I'll read the whole thing, and then we will walk it through together. John chapter 16, verses 16 through 33. It says, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me? And again, a little while, and you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. 
Now, Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you were asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father. And have come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. He just said all this amazing stuff, and all they could say is, oh, now you're not talking to us in riddles. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. When you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. All right, so three things that we're going to work through. The first is you will. Jesus is in a prophetic posture, and so we're going to talk about Jesus saying you will. He says it a bunch of times, you will. Okay, so we'll look at that. The second thing that we're going to look at is Jesus saying, so that you may have peace. We're going to talk about that concept of peace, where it comes from, and why Jesus can promise it so confidently. And then we'll look at that amazing statement, I have overcome the world. And we're going to talk about what that means for each of us. So let's start with the you wills. Jesus actually understands that the disciples and what they are going through is significant. They have had an only human experience with Jesus. Not to say that they have not had a supernatural experience, but for you and I, we've not walked with Jesus the human. So our experience has been entirely supernatural, where our relationship with him has been with the unseen. The spirit of God, the presence of God, the body of Christ, but not Jesus himself in the flesh. That's been our experience. Theirs was the opposite. They had walked with Jesus... For three years, they'd become intimate friends with him. John, all these years later, describes himself as the one whom Jesus loved. He remembers that last supper when he actually, he laid on Jesus' chest. That was the level of intimacy, the level of friendship that John articulated. And they're about to watch their friend, their rabbi, their mentor, be crucified, tortured in the way that the Roman government knew to be the most painful, the most difficult, the most, it's where we get the word excruciating. It's from the word crux, from the word cross. They were about to go through something highly traumatic. And so Jesus takes the time to prophesy and to tell them, to prepare them for what they were about to experience. And so he he walks through this and says a few things. He says, you will see me no longer and then you'll see me. Yes, I'm going away and yes, I'm coming back. And this is not the, the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. This is Jesus talking about death and resurrection. He's giving them the immediate prophetic happenings that are about to take place within the next 36 to 72 hours. That's what Jesus is doing. You're gonna see me and then you'll see me no longer. Then you'll see me again. I'm coming back. I'm going to be here. And then he, he kind of talks to the disciples. He's like, you guys are talking amongst yourselves and asking what I mean when I say that. 
And then he goes to this place. He says, it's like a woman having a baby. Now, we've had five children. And <laughs> is that right? Five? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> each time, uh, I've been an absolute mess, by the way. Uh, I'm, I am comical in the labor and delivery room, uh, sobbing, just um, a disaster. Kristen's trying to comfort me the whole time. <laughs> I'm just distraught, okay, each time. Uh, but there's this, you know, there's this incredible thing with, with having babies, and it's kind of strange, because this is Jesus talking to a bunch of dudes, and he's like, it's like when a woman has a baby. And that can sound a little strange, you know, I think, what do we call that these days? Mansplaining? He's, he's mansplaining uh, female anguish as it relates to having a baby. But really what it comes down to is this is just the common understanding uh, of the birthing pro- process, that there's extreme anguish but then that child is placed in a woman's arms and, and the anguish is turned to joy. There's, it's almost like divine forgetfulness. Kristen's talked to me about this a few times. Almost like a divine forgetfulness that you, you just don't quite remember the pain as it was that intense for that moment. And then you're ready for an, another baby. <laughs> just <laughs> shocking that anybody has more than one. <laughs> and Jesus is talking to them and he says, it's, it's going to be anguish for you. It's going to be extreme pain followed by the height of human joy. That's what you're about to go through. He's talking about his crucifixion and his resurrection. He is prophesying for their sake about how difficult it's going to be and then how beautiful it's going to be shortly after. He wants them to know. He wants to prepare them for what they are about to experience. So he takes time to say, you will weep and lament. You will be sorrowful. This is going to happen. It's going to be devastating. Now, there's something about this that I actually, I appreciate Jesus walking through human emotion with us. You guys are going to, you're going to grieve. You're going to watch me die. And it's going to be devastating. Jesus' attitude in this moment is not like, guys, you're going to need to suck it up a little bit because I'm going to be right back. Or he's not saying, don't worry about what you see. It's not a problem. I'll, you know, I'll be, right. I'll be right back. He's not comforting them. He's preparing them. Because what they experienced was the legitimate depths of human sorrow watching Jesus die. He even goes so far as to say, you will be scattered each to his own home. You guys are actually going to run to your homes. And he doesn't like pre-rebuke them. He's not even frustrated by this. He says, I will be alone, but I won't be alone. I'll have my father. You're going to abandon me at the cross, he tells them. And he's not even frustrated. He says, I'll, I'll, I'll have my father. But in a way, Jesus is telling them all of these things are going to happen and they're designed to happen for a purpose. And I'm telling you this so that even as they're happening, even as you're abandoning me at the cross and going to your home, I'm telling you this ahead of time so that you'll have peace as you're going through it. I want you in the midst of sorrow to still have peace. That's an important thing that Jesus talks about. He actually, in this moment, separates out our emotion from our state of being. So your emotions, they don't define who you are. Your emotions aren't who you are. So to say that you are sorrowful is a a declaration of your emotion, but to say that you have peace, that's a state of being. That's actually the ability to exist in divine peace even while you experience lament, grief, sorrow, pain, anguish. Those things aren't contradictory to Jesus. In fact, as difficult as the world gets and as heavy as the world gets and as chaotic as the world gets, peace is not contradictory to the global circumstances. And that's really important to hear Jesus say. Peace is available to you. Jesus has done this for you to give you peace even though trauma awaits You can walk through it with peace while experiencing emotion. 
Now, we've talked through this a number of times as we've gone through John. John uh, it reminds us of the times that Jesus shows us that our, our emotions don't dictate who we are and where we go and what we do, but, but our divine obedience, our will to obey God, that's what overcomes even our own emotional experiences. And as humans, we, we have sort of gotten caught up in this world where our emotions lead us. They sort of define where we go and what we do. And I, I don't know about you guys, but if you just went with your emotions 100% of the time, just take a quick moment and imagine what your life would look like <laughs> if you followed that thread for just a few, for a few days. There's a lot of chuckles because the reality is if we just, if we just followed our emotions, our emotions without understanding what Jesus is saying and helping us to go to a different place, we'd find ourselves in some pretty destructive places pretty quickly. So Jesus helps. He helps us walk through this. Now, I want to point something out. The context of what's being said is hyper to the moment of these guys and what's taking place. Jesus saying, I am about to go to the cross. You're going to experience these things, but I'm saying this to you so that you can have peace while I'm going through it. But as with everything that Jesus says, we can take a contextual moment and we can glean and we can grow and we can understand how do we apply things to our own lives in the midst of uh, our circumstances, even if they're not what Jesus was speaking to in that moment. And so I want to take a minute and I want to look at this idea of so that in me you may have peace. So we're down just a little ways uh, towards 32, 33, uh, we'll say 31 too. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? And he says, behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home. You will leave me alone, yet I'm not alone for the Father is with me. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. We don't do this just to have a, a thing to do on a Sunday, to have a group to belong to, to have some kind of moral compass, to, to like just have a, a church life that maybe the world views as a little bit better than a non-church life. Those aren't the reasons that we would step into this kind of a thing. We do this because we are united to Christ. That's what we've been talking about. Jesus said, abide in me and I will abide in you. There is a, a union with Christ that has taken place supernaturally. And so what we are as followers of Jesus, what we're experiencing is something totally and completely supernatural. Human beings united with Christ. And what Jesus has said many times and what he'll say again is that being united to Christ means that we're actually, we're united to each other. That we're in this together. Paul will tell us in Ephesians 4, sorry, this is actually a little tangent, but I feel like it's an important thing to say. Paul says in Ephesians 4 to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And sometimes we look at that and say, okay, we need to be unified. We need to try really hard to be unified. We need to do stuff to be unified. The reality of our Christian life is that we are unified whether we like it or not. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are bound to your brothers and sisters in Christ. You have no choice in that. Now, Paul does say, make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And that word maintain is pretty important. Act like what you are. If you are united with each other, act like it. If you're bound together in something bigger than yourself, act like it. And that's why I'm bringing this up right now is because Jesus says, in me you will have peace. Peace isn't one of those things that we look at and just say, oh man, I wish I had the peace of Jesus right now. It is a theological reality that you have peace in Christ. Now, part of our job is to act like it. To live out the reality 
of peace in Jesus. What is peace in Jesus? Peace in Jesus is the reality that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were enemies of God. You were rebels to the core, rebelling against the things and the way of God. And Jesus came and made peace. He reconciled you to the Father. And so now, there is no war between you and God. And this is, this is something that so many, we need to hear it over and over again. There is no war between you and God if you are in Christ. And that's why Paul can write so confidently in Romans 8.1 that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God does not condemn you because he has condemned in Christ your sin and he has accepted in Christ you. You are called sons and daughters. You are brought into the family of God. You have peace with God. You have it. It's yours. Now Jesus is inviting us to live in that peace. To rest in that peace. That whatever is happening out in the world, and maybe you, you might look back then and just like, what did they have to worry about? They were fishermen. They just sort of like lived a very simple life. They didn't travel that much. Their kids didn't play sports. They didn't have stuff to do. They just lived a simple life and walked around with Jesus and listened to him teach and ate whatever miracle he did that day. It just was a simple life. So what's the turmoil that Jesus is inviting them to avoid? We live a way more chaotic life. Our relationships are in turmoil. Our, our geopolitical situation is in turmoil. Our internal United States politics are in turmoil. Our economy feels like it's, it's like you could just walk through all the different categories of life and say turmoil, 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 turmoil. It's hard to say a lot of times. How could Jesus tell me to have peace when there's all of that chaos going on? It would be an oversimplified way of looking at what they were experiencing to say they had it easy. They were an occupied nation. They were an occupied nation. Let's just say, for the sake, we'll go hyper-relevant, for the sake of argument that Putin accomplishes whatever goal he has and has Ukraine under Russian control, and there are Ukrainians living inside of the now Russia. Ukraine no longer is, exists. There's no government left, but there are Ukrainian people living in the land that was formerly theirs. That's Matthew, and James, and John, and Jesus, and Judas, and Bartholomew. Bet you didn't know that Bartholomew was in occupied territory also. He was. All of them. They were under the occupation of Rome. Their taxes went to Caesar. Their temple existed because the Roman government decided that they weren't going to destroy the Jewish religion and force everybody into paganism. They were going to allow all the different places that they conquered to continue on in their, in their religious activities because that incited less rebellion. Sure, go ahead, be Jews, that's fine. That is the world that they lived in. And when they did rise up and try and overthrow Rome in just a few short years after these things were written, 70 AD, Jerusalem was leveled. The temple destroyed. When many of them were still alive and ministering around the world, gone. And Jesus says, I say these things so that in me, you might have peace. You need to hear this. Our peace, our ability to have it, is not dependent on our circumstances. The world could go 10,000 miles down the road of chaos, and you, as a follower of Jesus, have the power, the ability to be at peace at all times in Jesus. Because you are not enemies with God. And that leads us to the last part of this. 
what did Jesus accomplish? So look at his last sentence, John 16, 33. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, I have overcome the world. We're going to pick this apart because we need to know what's being said here. Let's start with the phrase, take heart. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to a minute of silence. I want you to just think about the phrase, take heart. I want you to think about what it, uh, what it inspires in you. Think about things that might be synonymous with it. I want you to just think about the, the phrase, take heart for a minute in silence and what is being said to you. Just think about that for a minute. The phrase take heart, Uh, I'll go Greek for just a minute and Preston can correct all of it. It's a PhD in New Testament. I always get nervous going here. (laughs) Present active imperative. Okay, what that means is that Jesus is commanding the disciples to take heart. And what he's saying is I want you to have perpetual courage. But there's a command element to it. That's the imperative. It's not passive just to say, have courage. It's the active component of it, the imperative component of it that says, take it. Be courageous. The phrase fear not comes up in the Bible about 365 times, depending on your translation. Fear not. It's over and over and over and over in the Bible. Fear not. Now, one of the things that can happen when we hear a phrase like, don't be afraid, or, or something like that, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where somebody's had to coach you through something terrifying, and they've told you, don't be afraid, and, and maybe there's something in you that's just like kind of kicking back a little bit, saying, who are you to tell me not to be afraid right now? On what authority can you tell me not to be afraid right now? A lot of times, we... We think about the phrase, don't be afraid. And we just, eh, if all I have is fear and all you're saying is don't be afraid, there's a disconnect. But Jesus actually gives us the authority by which he says to take heart, to take courage, to be perpetually courageous. To, to gird up your loins. That's what the Old Testament would have said in this moment. To gear up, to go. Jesus says, for I have overcome the world. You don't need to be afraid. In fact, you can take heart. You can be perpetually courageous because I've overcome the world. Now, this is a huge statement. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. The word that that's based off of, uh, anybody's wearing a pair of Nikes, it's the word Nike. It's where Nike comes from. It means victory. Jesus is saying, take heart. There will be tribulation, but take heart because I have victory. It's done. It's finished. What do, you th- what do you think, and maybe you don't know the story, but Jesus was on the cross. What do you think he meant when from the cross he says the words, it is finished? Have you ever just pondered for a minute, like, what was finished? What did Jesus accomplish on the cross? And Jesus is saying, 
I have overcome the world. You don't have to be afraid because whatever the world had to throw at us, death and sin and destruction and pain and perpetual difficulty, whatever it was, I've overcome the world. The world itself cannot hold me. I have overcome the world. Now, when Jesus says this, he's still in this prophetic moment where he's talking about what is about to take place. Is it actually, it wasn't Jesus' teaching that has overcome the world, and it wasn't Jesus' miracles that have overcome the world. And the reality is, it was not the cross that had overcome the world. We've said this before, if all we have as the people of God is the cross, according to Paul, we are of all people most to be pitied. There's no Christian faith if all we have is the cross. We are utterly dependent on the empty tomb. That is the statement of victory. We call the cross Good Friday because it points to Resurrection Sunday, the day that Jesus emerged, conquering death. Oh, death, where is your sting? What do you have on us? If Jesus has overcome death, he becomes the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Jesus is the first among the family to rise from the dead. Death has no hold on us. He has overcome the world. You don't need to be afraid in this life because he's overcome the world. It is finished. Take heart. Whatever Jesus asks of you, you can charge ahead because he's overcome the world. Now, John's an interesting guy. He wrote the book of John. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. He wrote the book of Revelation. The way that we understand it is the book of John was written somewhere in the middle of his life and ministry, but towards the end. Uh, Revelation towards the end, but 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, he was an old man. He was an old man reflecting back on this life with Jesus. I want you to go to 1 John chapter 5. I want to look at verses 3 through 5. John is an old man reflecting on the words of Jesus. Jesus saying, I have overcome the world. He writes this. He says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory, the Nike, that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? I want you to think about this for just a minute. John, uh, we believe here, is probably in his 80s, maybe even his 90s. He is an old man. And he's looking back on these words of Jesus. And he's had years to brew on this, to process this, to meditate on the words of Jesus. The Spirit of God has brought them to his remembrance. Over and over and over, these words have been run through John's mind a thousand times. And he's like, you know what? If Jesus overcame the world, guess who else did? Everyone who's born of Jesus overcomes the world. He's not just the firstborn among many brothers and sisters in the future. He's the firstborn among brothers and sisters today. Paul will reflect on this same concept in Romans 6 when he says that we are no longer slaves to sin. There was a a time when we were bound by sin to a certain way of living, and that is gone. I love the song that we sing. These chains are gone. I've been set free. 
I was a slave to sin and have been released into what? What have you been released into? You've been released into life and righteousness and good and all that God has for this world. You have been commissioned into it as his people by his spirit to carry his name and you have overcome the world. When you are born of the Spirit, you have overcome the world. Now, I, I could try and talk about what it means to live a life of having overcome the world. And there's some, there's some challenges to that because the reality is I could, I could come up with some examples of it, but, but here's the thing. Part of the journey of walking with Jesus is carrying his words and his way into your life. Waking up tomorrow morning and saying, okay, my name's Brandon. I'm a CHP officer. I follow Jesus and he's overcome the world. What does it look like for me to live as one that has overcome the world because my Savior has overcome the world? What, what grip does the world have on me today? And the answer is none. In Jesus, none. I can release the things of the world. I don't have to love the world or the things of the world. In the view of Jesus, everything else can melt away but part of your job as a follower of Jesus is to live that out every day. Jesus has overcome the world. And in Jesus, I've overcome the world. So what does it look like for me today to be courageous, to respond to the call of God on my life, the mission that he has empowered me into today without fear because he has overcome the world? I can tell you this, the mission of Jesus is pretty specific. And John says it, he says, I write these things so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus will say it, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, so go and make disciples, teach them to obey, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you to the very end of the age. The call of God on your life is not ambiguous. You don't need to walk around wondering, I wonder what God's plan is for me. You have it. Now, where that goes and how that takes shape and who you marry and what school you go to, those are some, those are some decisions to be made on the path. But there is this foundational reality of every single one of us that if we have Jesus... We live Jesus and we share Jesus every day, all the time. It's what we do. It's what we do. It's who we are. I'll close with this. When Jesus says, take heart, He's calling on a group of disciples that are about to watch him be tortured and killed. And then he's going to rise from the grave. He's going to walk through a couple of walls and appear in their, in their hangout times, which is a little strange for them. He's going to eat some meals with them. Thomas is going to put his hand in his side. He's going to see the, the flesh of Jesus crucified. These things are going to happen and then Jesus is going to commission them and ascend and be gone. He says that. Back in, back in John 16, he says, I came from the Father, verse 28, and have come into the world and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. There's a new era that's about to take shape. It's you here on earth with my spirit, but I will not be here. There was a short stretch in the disciples' life where, like the, the lead goose in the V, Jesus was cutting through the wind. 
He was breaking the resistance. He was opening the pathway for the disciples to walk in the things that Jesus was doing. Peter climbing out of the boat and walking on water. Jesus walked on water first. They saw it. They experienced it. They tasted it. They felt it. And Jesus was removing that resistance. And now he's saying there's going to be much tribulation. Take heart. I've done it. I've overcome the world. You can do what I'm asking you to do. My encouragement to you. This isn't just another Sunday. This isn't just another church meeting. I believe that we are a part of something supernatural. That around the world today, right now, the body of Christ is gathering. Some last night, some into tonight, the body of Christ is gathering around the world, praying, taking communion together, seeking the things of Jesus, encouraging one another, stirring each other up and saying, let's go out into the world and let's show people the love and mercy and goodness of Jesus. And you are linked with them arm in arm as the body of Christ to show the world the goodness of God. If you have the spirit of God, the call is go and show the world the goodness of God today, tomorrow, every day. That's what we do. And I want to say, the disciples in this moment, they could have said, wait, 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 we don't know how. Hold on, time out. We need to be taught. We need to be equipped. We need more. Train us. Teach us. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Go. You got this. You've got this. Go carry my name. You're equipped. You're empowered. You're sent. You're full of God's presence. You lack nothing today that you need to go out this afternoon or tomorrow or the next day or the next and to represent Jesus in the world that he's empowered you into, that he's entrusted to you. You lack nothing. What you carry is enough. Go. Take heart. Lord, uh, I don't know where this church is is going to land. When I say that, I mean, I don't know where each of these individual people will be this afternoon, tomorrow, next month, next year, next decade. But I know that in you, they can have peace and they can have the power to go. You guys don't mind, I'm going to pray for opportunity. But I pray that you would open doors like sooner rather than later for conversations, for witness, for testimony, for healing, for prophetic words, for encouragement, for a chance for somebody to open up the pages of the scripture and show a friend the power of God's word to call them into life with you. Lord, I pray for coffees and for lunches and for walks and for hangouts while pushing the kids on the swings, for sideline conversations at the soccer game, for work meetings. I pray for opportunities for your name to be spoken. Lord, I pray for our friends in Madrid and Porto that as they go, to Poland, to Moldova, to Ukraine, to grab people that when people say, why are you here? They can say, I'm here in the name of Jesus and I want to tell you about how good this God is that knows you and loves you and wants to help you today. Lord, I pray that your name would be spoken boldly. Lord, this is a season of harvest a time for people to come to you 
to repent of brokenness and even of wasted time. And to say, yes, Jesus, I'm yours. Let's go. Jesus, you've overcome the world. Help us to walk in that today. It's in your name we pray, amen.